Word from the Lord, James Ophir here with you. Tonight, if you are interested, I'm going to be admitting I made a mistake. So stay tuned. We'll discuss what that is. Word from the Lord is uh, brought to you by the uh, Churches of Christ. The Church of Christ meeting in Eden, uh, North Carolina, is meets at 2 feet of the Boulevard. And we'd be glad to see you there. Sundays at 9 uh, a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship. You can reach me at uh, 276-340-2653, 276-340-2653, a word from the Lord at gmail.com, a word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me if you want to, uh, if you'd like to hear, uh, have a Bible discussion or you'd like to have a Bible study, we'd be glad to help you any way that we can. Uh, the church in Eden also meets at uh, 7 o'clock on Thursday nights. And we'd be glad to see you there and uh, come out and visit with us anytime you have a chance to do that very thing. So we hope that you will take advantage of that. Um, everything that we have is free, DVDs, uh, literature, everything's free. We want to um, assist you in studying God's Word, so we hope that you will do that very thing. Also remember, a Word from the Lord uh, a radio edition, uh, Sundays at 5 p.m. on uh, local radio, 1490, WLOE, 1420W. M Y N. We started Sunday, and this it was uh, went pretty well. If you're outside of this area or you can't pick up the the uh, the station, <coughs> um, you can listen to it at the Rockingham County Radio. Uh, just go to Rockingham County Radio RCR24.com, and uh, there's live streaming there. Or you download the RCR app on your phone. It uh, it looks just like that, uh, yellow, RCR, doesn't have the 24 on it, but just type in Rockingham County uh, Radio into your Google Play Store or whatever your app store is, and uh, it'll come up, download it on your phone. If you go to the website, if you go to uh, Rockingham County Radio uh, on the, uh, the streaming player, you can actually click on the icon that says stream, a, uh, one of those, I can't remember what kind of uh, uh, bars they are, the square ones. Uh, you can scan that in with your smartphone, and it will download the app to your phone just like that. So, I mean, it is very, very easy to to uh, uh, get on your phone. We had some individuals that called uh, last week. One of them said he was listening on, on the app, and it sounded great. Uh, several people were listening online as well, so we know that it uh, sounds great, and so we hope that you will uh, make plans on Sundays at 5 p.m. to be tuning into a word from the Lord uh, on the radio, and uh, so we hope that you will take advantage of that very thing as well. All right, so I said I made a mistake, and I'm going to uh, uh, let you know what that is, but first, one more teaser. You know, Job said in Job 31, verse 35, he said, oh, that my adversary had written a book, and the reason why it's good if your adversary writes something down is because then it's there. You know, you can see it. And friends, when we're talking about what religious people believe, one of the greatest things, one of the greatest benefits of, 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 of teaching is being able to go and say, this is what you believe, this is what, what you said, this is what you say about yourself. And so when denominations write about themselves, they get to see, they, uh, they get to see uh, what they say. Sometimes it's not easy to swallow, but yet that is the case. Now, I made a statement about the Methodist Church uh, online, having an online uh, discussion with a gentleman, and this is what I said. I said the Methodist Church does not use the Bible as its standard for authority. And then I gave a quote that I found at the umc.org, and it had to do with uh, their stand or what they were saying about homosexuality. Here's the quote. Here's the quote from their website. Uh, the 2016 General Conference in Portland, Oregon, said the bishops asked for the body's permission to name a special committee that would completely examine and possibly recommend revisions of every paragraph in the Book of Discipline related to human sexuality. The commission would uh, represent the different re uh, regions of, a of the denomination on four continents as well as a varied perspective on the church. The Book of Discipline is the denomination's governing document. Now, I said, my, or again, my quote was that the uh, 
the Methodist Church does not use the Bible as its standard for authority. Okay. Well, this is what the man I was having a discussion with, this is what he said. He said, your statement that the Methodist Church does not use the Bible as its standard of authority is absolutely incorrect. Consult the link, and then he gives the link there, umc.org, what we believe, Westland Quadrilateral, for our official position on this matter. I already know you reject this material, but I provide it in the interest of accuracy. Okay, well, here is the Westland Quadrilateral. This is the, what he cited, and this is what it says about the Bible. And uh, I just want you to notice, we'll, we'll come back to this article a little bit later if we have time. But it says, for United Methodists, Scripture is considered the primary source and standard for Christian doctrine. All right, Scripture is the, considered the primary source and standard for Christian doctrine. Now, again, what I said was the Methodist Church does not use the Bible as it's standard for authority. So, here's my correction. I stand corrected. I stand correctly. Clearly, they say they use the Bible uh, as a source for their doctrine. So, let me rephrase. Let me rephrase what I should have said. The Methodist Church does not use the Bible as its only standard for authority. How about that? Either way, whether they don't use it for their authority or it's not their only standard for authority, either way they're saying they need something more than the Bible as their authority. So I can, I can stand to be uh, corrected. I can stand to, to uh, make corrections when I misspeak. So that's my correction. I should have said the Methodist Church does not use the Bible as its only standard for authority because clearly it doesn't. Clearly they use... They use the Methodist discipline as well. Uh, given, the, given the article that I quoted, that I cited right here, the Book of Discipline is the denomination's governing document right from the UnitedMethodistChurch.org. Now, the, the gentleman that, that, was, that brought this to my attention, he said, that's not right. You need to go to the United Methodist, the UMC.org uh, side, and here's the official position on this matter, and this is provided in the interest of accuracy. Okay. So in the interest of accuracy, they use the Scripture as the primary source of standard, uh, primary source and standard for a Christian doctrine. But it's not the secondary, it's not the only, it's just the first one that they use, they say. So, they use two, they have two sources of authority. Now, did you notice anything interesting about the two articles, the one that I quoted and the one that he quoted? Did you notice anything interesting about what he said as their official uh, uh, document or uh, official information versus what I said? Did you notice anything about that at all? Anything interesting? Well, here, let me give you a clue. Both of them came from the United Methodist church's website, the umc.org. Now, the official position could be found at, the, at umc.org, and then I quoted, I quoted from the umc.org that said that the book, of, uh, uh, the book of Discipline is their governing document. Now, talk about accuracy. In the interest of accuracy, he's going to tell, he's going to tell me to go to this place? Well, all that did is confuse the matter. All, all that did is confuse the matter. Now you've got two sources of authority. Well, which one's best? If the, if the book of discipline, if the Methodist book of discipline is better than the Bible, let's get rid of the Bible. If the Bible is better than the book of discipline, why do we need the book of discipline? If they're equal, why do you say one's primary? Why not say they're co-authoritative? Why not say that they're both being used? Why don't you go ahead and admit that? Because apparently on the official website, it, that's what we're being told. That's what we're being told. Now, I, I want to tell you, friends, I am not trying to, you know, rile this man up. We've had some very civil discussions, uh, and I think he's being very respectful. I'm trying to be very respectful. I hope that it comes across that way. But my point is, if you are going to be, defend a church that's not in the Bible, then you will have to do better than giving some 
a source of authority that only shows that, well, you have two sources of authority. That doesn't prove that you use the Bible as your authority. All that did is show that, you know what, you can't make up your mind whether the Bible is true or not. And friends, really, when it gets right down to it, this is not just about the Methodist Church. This is about all denominations. This is the same problem that all denominations have. It just so happens that I'm having a discussion with this man who's in the Methodist Church. But listen to what he says. I want to go through, I want to go through the rest of his comment, and let's just notice some things that I think really uh, uh, shed some light on the mindset of individuals who are in denominations. I'm trying to be very respectful here. But I'm showing you, friends, when people think a certain way, it's hard to unlearn it. <clears throat> and oftentimes you don't see where you're making a mistake because you're so close to what you're believing. That's contrary to the Bible that you can't see the contradiction that you have with the Bible. Listen to what this man says in his defense of the Methodist, uh, the Methodist church. He said, I'm providing this uh, uh, material in the interest of accuracy. He said, uh, I respect your views on this matter. Now, please hear me. Okay. I'm glad that he's listening, or at least giving an ear to what I'm saying. I hope that it, that it will resonate with him. I'm going to listen to him. I'm actually taking the time. I've read this uh, statement that he made several times as I'm looking through this, and uh, I think it shows, like I said, I think it shows some uh, areas where people get off and where they divert and why they have trouble hearing the truth when it comes right from the Bible. He said, I respect your views on this matter. Now, please hear me. It's a beautiful sentiment, or a beautiful statement, to say your faith uses no guidance other than the Bible itself until one gets really uh, gets into the close particular details. All right. So when we say the Bible is our only source of authority, and when we're saying the Bible is all that we use for guidance, and that that's all we use, he said, oh, that sounds good. That sounds good. Until you get into the close details, the particular details, or practical details. Well, friends, does the Bible not cover the close practical details? Does the Bible not cover details that we're going to need to be accountable to God, to give God what he wants? Does the Bible not cover those close particular details? I find it very interesting that someone would make this statement who, the, who has previously said that they use the Bible as their source of authority, albeit it's just their primary source of authority. See, when you say it's the primary source of authority, you're already showing that you really don't have full appreciation or confidence in the Bible. And then this statement just magnifies that, that problem. The Bible is good until you get to the close, practical uh, details. Listen, in 2 uh, Timothy, Timothy 3 and verse 16, and most people will know this, they should know this uh, by heart, you might say. Second uh, Timothy 3 and verse 16. Paul said, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So every, all the scriptures that we have is profitable. Now listen, verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now you think about this statement friends, all scripture makes it so that the man of God, now we're not talking about just somebody that claims to be a Christian, the man of God, a man of God is one who sets forth or tells, a spokesman, he's a spokesman for God. If you look through the, the Old Testament, the man of God was always a prophet or someone like that. So we're not talking about just some, some guy in a pew, we're talking about the man of God that, can, that uh, is, is provided everything he needs to teach even on the close particular details. The Bible provides the man of God everything he needs so that he can be perfect and thoroughly furnished with all good works. In other words, every tool is in the toolbox. You ever come to work on a project? It's like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go do this house repair. 
And you go to work and you go, man, I can't find my screwdrivers. You got to get up and you go find a screwdriver. You know, your wife or somebody borrowed it. Right? Then you get back, you find a screwdriver, you get back to work. Man, I need a wrench. Where's that wrench? It's not in my toolbox. Let me go find the wrench. And so it's not in the toolbox. The things you need are not in the toolbox. Well, when it comes to the Bible, God has put all the tools in the toolbox so that the man of God is perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That is, what's the good works? The good works of, of teaching, there's doctrine, for approving, for correcting, and instructing individuals. All the tools are in the toolbox. Now, friends, please tell me. Please tell me what particular detail, particular, uh, or excuse me, what practical details, what close practical details does the Bible not deal with? What practical details are left out of the Bible? What things might you encounter that the Bible's not going to answer when it comes to life and godliness? Peter said in 2 Peter 1 verse 3, he said, according to his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us into glory and virtue. So what, what does the Bible leave out? Well, what are the details that are, that are amiss that we need something else? All right? What are the details that, that, are, uh, that, are, that are lacking? Can you please tell me? I mean, what, what is it? How to deal with your brethren? You know what? You got brethren have trouble all the time. He's going to talk about uh, later on. He's going to talk about everybody being different. How to deal with the problems? What? what? You, the Bible doesn't deal with that. The Bible deals with that. The Bible says what to do uh, with with brethren. If thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between him and thee alone. But thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then what do you do? You take one or two more with you. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything, every word should be established. Then what do you do? If he will not, if he neglects to hear you, tell it to the church. If he neglects to hear the church, then let him be as a heathen and a public man. What's so hard about that? That's some pretty good details, isn't it? There's some, there's some close, practical details about husbands and wives found in the Bible in Ephesians 5. There are some close, practical details about husbands and wives in 1 Corinthians 7. There's some close, practical details about how to raise your children in Ephesians chapter 6. There's some close practical details in, in Ephesians chapter 6 about uh, how to be a good worker. There's all kinds of close practical details in the Bible. So what is it that the Bible's missing? What is it that it's leaving out? What is that amiss that, that we need something more than the Bible? See, that's what we're getting at, friends. When individuals say, well, the Bible's good, until you really get down to the to the uh, uh, you know the fine details, you know that's when you need that's when you need men to come along with the catechism or a creed book or a discipline or something like that. Really, see, friends, I'm saying here's the fundamental problem that people have: they don't believe the Bible is enough. And I know that, and I'm going to prove that to you. Listen to the next statement that he makes. He said. Uh, what if everyone, everybody in the U.S. converted to your faith? You would have to have thousands of pastors coast to coast. How could you make sure they all interpret the Bible the same way? Well, friends, let's again show some fundamental problems that we're having. We're, when we're talking like denominations, and we're talking about when we're talking how men talk, we're always going to come into problems. Friends, number one, I don't want everybody to convert to my faith. I want them to convert. I want them to be obedient to the gospel, which would be the faith. But it's not my faith. I'm not, I'm not the one who originated with it. It originates with God. All right? Look, in Ephesians 4 and verse 5, there is one faith. And like I said, here's the fundamental problem. People say, well, you got all these different faiths out here. No, there's only one. There's only one that's authorized by God. There's only one that a person should be uh, involved in. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, if you want to put Methodist, Baptist, Wesleyan, Presbyterian, Episcopalians, Mormons, Lutherans, whatever, all in this one faith, then you're going to have trouble. That's a whole other lesson. But one faith, one faith. So I'm not trying to convert people to my faith. Now, I want them to believe like I believe, but that's not my faith. It's the Bible. It's the system, the faith. 
uh, that was once delivered, Jude, verse 3. So he says, if everybody convert to your faith. Now, so let's say we know what he's talking about. He's talking about everybody becoming a member of the Church of Christ. That would be wonderful. That would be so wonderful. If everyone in the United States was a member of the Church of Christ, it would be a whole lot better place. I guarantee it. I guarantee it would be a whole lot better place. He said, you would have to have thousands of pastors coast to coast. Well, no doubt. You'd have to have thousands of pastors, and by pastors, I mean elders, bishops, uh, 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 overseers, shepherds. That's how I mean pastors, because that's how the Bible talks about it. But you would also need preachers and evangelists, individuals that would also do some teaching. Of course, the pastors would do teaching as well. But we're using Bible terms the way the Bible uses them, so I have to define these terms. But yes, you would need thousands of people to teach. Now, his question is, how could you make sure they all interpret the Bible the same way as yourself? See, friends, again, here's the fundamental problem that we're having here. In John 17, in John 17, in verse 17, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus is in the garden. He's praying. He says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, uh, verse 19, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they, might, they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, Jesus prayed for unity, and he said it's going to come through their word. They will believe on God through their, through their word that we all may be one. Well, their word was the word that Christ gave them from the Father. I've given them your word, all right? Now, friends, here is here's what we're talking about, this fundamental problem, this fundamental flaw. When someone says, how are you going to get everybody to interpret the Bible the same as yourself? Friends, do you realize Jesus prayed for unity? So Jesus had this idea that everyone could be in agreement when it comes to what he said. Now, when someone says, well you're not going to be able to ensure that everyone's going to believe and teach the same way you do. Friends, I'm not trying to guarantee it. I'm saying if individuals who are honest and sincere, when it, when it comes to Bible study, they will then come to an agreement. Do you realize, friends, that there are churches across all across this country that believe the same thing, teach the same thing, practice the same thing? And it doesn't have anything to do with the hierarchy. We didn't have to, we didn't have, to have individuals getting together to make a creed book or a catechism that says, hey, we're all going to agree together. They came to an agreement based upon just reading the Bible. Now let me ask you this. How did Christ make sure the Bible was going to be interpreted the same way? I mean, he prayed for unity. How did he expect everyone who went out into the world preaching the gospel when he said go into all the world and preach the gospel? How did he expect them to come to the same uh, a conclusion about what the Bible taught. How did he expect them to interpret the Bible the same way? He didn't set up a committee. He didn't set up a, a convention. He didn't have a group of scholars that are going to review what, each, what everybody else thought and say, ah, right, now let's go with this. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He didn't say and then consult the, the convention so that we can all make sure we're in agreement together. See, friends, here's the problem. Why indict God on his writing ability? When someone says, well, you can't ensure everybody's going to agree. No, I can't. But it's not the Bible's fault that men can't agree on what the Bible says. And it's not my place to then come up with a way to get people to agree on what I think the Bible says. I say, just read the Bible. Oftentimes when I'm having a Bible study, friends, what I'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll come to a passage and I'll say, I'll read that. Read that. And what happens is when they read it, 
then they they get what it means. How the Bible said it was a man not too long ago. We were talking about marriage. I said, went to Matthew 19, 9. I said, read that. I said, just read it. Matthew 19, 9. Just read it. But put it up here. Matthew 19, 9. And he read it. And shall marry another commit adultery. And whoso marrieth there which is put away does commit adultery. He said, You're saying I can't be married. I didn't say anything. You read it. But that's exactly what the verse says, and that's exactly what Christ meant. See? I don't I don't have to give you a a a, 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 a book that tells you how to interpret the something or how to think the way I do. Just read the Bible. And we'll come to the same conclusion if we're honest. But why, why indict God? Why say that God can't write a book that we can all understand? See that? Listen, he goes on to say, he said, I guarantee that at some point you would have to provide them with some type of written guidance, creedal statements, no different than what we do and to which you object. You guarantee that I'm going to have to have some kind of written guidance to get everybody to agree with something that God has already written? Friends, that's very insulting. That's insulting to me. I can't imagine how God feels. God inspired men to write this book, and then a man comes along and says, well, if, we, if you're all going to agree, to agree on it, you're going to have to have somebody to have some written guidance on how to agree with it. Really? You have to have some instruction for the instructions? <clears throat> now I put some things together, worked on some projects where I needed some instructions to understand the instructions. But that's because those instructions were written by men. But to say that I need instructions on God's instructions is a prime example of what we're talking about. People do not believe what the Bible says. They do not believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. And it's evident by the fact that they come along and say, well, we can't agree with the Bible. We need some, some catechism, some creedal statements in order to get guidance to get everybody to agree with the same thing. Friends, I don't know about you, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful here, but, you know, I, I don't think... I don't think that the Methodist the the writers of the Methodist discipline are smarter than God. Now that's just me talking, but you know what? I don't think you need instruction to understand God's word. I don't think you need instruction to understand the Bible. So when someone comes along and says, "Well, you need some instruction to understand the Bible," no, friends, I, I think you're missing it. I think you're missing it. And then he goes on to say this. He goes on to say. That raises the next issue. For you to claim you are completely squared away on, Bible, on biblical interpretation, a subject which scholars have argued for centuries, is quite arrogant and is a claim none of my pastors would make. You know what, friend? Arrogance. Arrogance is not saying, I believe we can understand the Bible a lot. That's not arrogance. Arrogant is not saying, you know what, the things that I believe do not contradict the Bible. In other words, the thing I believe about the Bible over here does not contradict what the Bible says over here. That's not arrogant, friends. That is correct biblical interpretation. That's looking at the Bible and saying God wouldn't say one thing over here and then contradict himself over here. God wouldn't require one thing over here and then condemn you when you did it. See, that's not, that's not arrogant. That's not arrogant. That's, that's good, sound, biblical interpretation. What's arrogant? What's arrogant is to say, well, <clears throat> we believe the Bible is the Word of God, and it is a primary source, a primary source for authority, but we need some creedal statements, a book, like the Methodist discipline, in order to understand what God wrote because obviously God couldn't write it clear the first time. Friends, now that's arrogant. Now, I don't care what you say about your pastors wouldn't make that claim, but the fact that you are telling me you use the Bible as a source of authority and then turn around and say 
You couldn't get people to agree on what the Bible says without some kind of creedal statement. Now, friends, that's arrogant. Not to mention the fact that it's, I say it's blasphemous. To say that God can't write a book that we can understand? Now, I'm not trying to make you mad, friends. And, and again, I'm not saying this is just a method of church. I'm saying this is all denominations that come up with their creed books or catechisms or their manuals because they say we can't understand the Bible like so we're going to start writing things. And in doing so, they're dividing themselves from everyone else, moving further and further away from what the Bible says that God says we can't understand. Listen, when Paul said in Ephesians, when Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, and verse 4, when he says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, friends, that, that doesn't indicate at all that we need some kind of group of people writing another book to understand the Bible. When I read what Paul wrote, I can understand what Paul wrote. And I don't need some doctor, Ph.D., right reverend, so-and-so that went through years and years of theology in some man-made school that professes to be a, a doctor because he's got letters after his name to tell me something different that I can read on my own. Just let me read the book. But friends, you're, you're following the pastors that are claiming, no, we're not arrogant. You know, my, we, wouldn't, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't say that uh, we have biblical interpretation squared away. Well, that's foolish. Because the Bible says you can. You can have it squared away. It's not arrogant to, to be right. But the problem is, friends, when we say that we are squared away on biblical interpretation because what we're teaching is not contradicting the Bible in another place, so you, 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 you're just arrogant. Why? Is it arrogant if you're correct about something? I'm not trying to be arrogant. You know, the... The student that makes a hundred on the test in school, all right, they go to they go to class and they uh, they make a they they did study they studied for their test and they made a hundred on it. They got everything right, all, answered all the questions right. Do the other students who didn't make a hundred on their test do they get, do they then get to come up and go? Well, you're kind of arrogant. You think you're you, you got everything all squared away? Well, I got it all answered right. Just because you didn't get the answers right, just because you got some questions wrong, doesn't mean that the other person's arrogant. Now let's just take that a step further. What if the student that made 100 on their test turns around and says, you know what, hey, let me help you study, and let's correct the things that you did wrong on the test, so the next test you'll get them right. Is that arrogant? No. And friends, that's what I'm saying. You're in a church that's not in the Bible. Guess what? Guess what? You may have some things right. You believe that God uh, is the one true God? You believe Jesus Christ is his son? You believe in the Holy Spirit? You got some things right? Hey, let, let us go back. Let me go back and you, help you. Get the things right. But instead, you want to say, well, you're arrogant because you think you got everything right. No, I'm not arrogant because I think I got everything right. It's just telling you a fact. The church I'm in, the church I'm a member of, is the church you read about in the Bible. And we're doing things as the Bible says. We have Bible authority for the things we say and do. We do Bible things in Bible ways, and we practice what the Bible says to do. So if you're, if you're contradicting what the Bible says in an area, don't get mad at me. Why am I arrogant all of a sudden? What the kids say, haters going to hate? Listen, don't hate me. I'm just trying to show you the right way. Paul says we can understand it. The arrogance is thinking that you then can write a book that everybody can understand. Well, let me tell you something. Does everybody need to be a member of the Methodist Church? You, you've got all these scholars that are writing the creed books, the discipline, that will help bring unity that Christ prayed for, that will help get everybody to believe the same thing, but do you think that everybody out there outside the Methodist Church is wrong? Yes? No? What, which one is it? 
If you think that everybody outside the middle of the church is wrong, guess what? Now, who's arrogant? Who's really arrogant? You're doing all this writing to get people to believe and agree on the same thing, but yet you think everybody else is lost. I bet you don't think the Mormons are saved. Probably don't think the Catholics are saved. <clears throat> or the Jehovah's Witness. But yet you want to say, well, you know, we're arrogant. I'm going to tell you, friends, I don't know what's worse, arrogance or just being willfully ignorant. Church, you're not in the Bible. It doesn't matter how many scholars you have on your side. It's not going to help you in the long run. Listen, he says it's arrogant to claim that you're square on Bible interpretation. Listen, in John 10, verse 33, John 10, verse 34, Jesus said, the scripture cannot be broken. That means one scripture is not going to contradict another scripture. What Jesus said in John 10, verse 34, was in harmony with what the psalm said. Now, here's my point, friends. If a man's interpretation conflicts with what's written, it's not the Bible's fault. Don't say, well, you can't understand the Bible. You ought to say, you know what, the man got it wrong. And that's the whole point that I was trying to make. This whole, this whole conversation started about women preachers. When the Bible says that a pastor is to be the husband of one wife, friends, that blatantly contradicts the Bible when a man says when, uh, there's going to be a woman pastor. See that? You got to work the Lord. Hey, Brother James. Hey. It's a good program tonight. I was just, uh, I hope your friend's watching, and I, I hope he has an honest heart, but I'd like to present something to him. If, you know, I know the Methodists believe that uh, among the baptism is sprinkling, and so I was wondering if he could uh, show from the discipline or, you know, the Bible, how that's going to harmonize with the Bible when the Bible plainly says it's a burial. You know, how did they misinterpret that? Right. I, and, you know, I, I, that's, that's, I think that's my, uh, what, what I understand People say, well, you, you're you arrogant. You think you got everything squared away, but yet you you just open, they just open the door and say, well, it don't really matter what you believe. Well, then why are you making an issue about what I, I say about it then? And you know? I believe it's the case that the, the Methodists, they don't believe in born in sin. Um, I, I don't know. No, no, I think they do. I don't know. I did. I'd have check on that. Well, I was. I was thinking that that's one thing that they they might have right, and right. you know that's that's different from what the Baptists teach. And the Baptist scholars they wrote their you know Baptist faith and message trying to explain born and sin. So right, but the scholars are not getting it. Exactly. Well, and but you had a, a great uh, verse up there before uh, Mark sixteen sixteen. How in the world? Do they misinterpret that? I mean, that's as plain as it gets. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Right. And yet they want to put in amniotic fluid. Daniel Lackey, you know, he claims that water there is amniotic fluid. <laughs> it's just it's amazing how they get their interpretation. I don't, I don't understand it. Okay. Well, here's here's the answer to your question. Of course, this is the this is the problem here when you say, what do people believe about a certain thing? Well, if it's not in the Bible... You know, it's I don't really know what they believe because you asked me a question about something that's not in the Bible. But this is from the U, the UMC dot org, which is the same place that he said go for the source of authority that they believe the Bible. Uh, the question is, uh, let me see if I can make it a little smaller here, and I'll just put it over there where everybody can see. This is. UnitedMethodistChurch.org and here's the question does the Methodist Church believe that babies are born in sin uh, and then they, it comes up here it says yes we do yes here. yes we do believe that babies at birth are contaminated by sin wow. so uh, well, the ancient, the ancient that. teaching, the ancient teaching of the church on this is called the doctrine of original sin. That's a horrible doctrine. So, 
And then they go on to say, the articles of religion in our book of discipline state, uh, article 7 of or, original or birth sin uh, standeth not in the following of Adam, but in the corruption of the nature of every man that nature that naturally is in, engendered in the offspring of Adam, whereby man is very far gone from original righteousness and of his own nature inclined to evil and that continually. So, uh, yeah, the answer to your questions, yeah, they do. So, so if a baby died, you know, like two days after right. death, they would have to say that baby's lost in it for eternity because Jesus said in John 8, if you <coughs> die in your sins where I am, there you cannot come. So, right. And, and just going to happen when, you know, when, you, when you've got a... You misinterpret that. Right. And when you've got a doctrine that's contrary to the Bible, then you have to have something else contrary to the Bible to cover that. So, yeah, it's just... It's, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. It's, it's basically, you know, what you had up there about the other guy talking about, you know, you explained to him uh, Matthew 19, 9, and he read it, and he said, well, that means I can't be married. Well, that's the reason they need all these doctrines and creeds, because... Right. The Bible, the Bible doesn't say what they want to do, and so they have to have something to, to justify what they're wanting to do rather than what the Bible says is right. Right. That's right. That's right. That's so, good program. All right. Thanks for your call, brother. Uh -huh. Bye. Right, bye. All right. So, uh, when we're talking about, you know, here's a man that says you squared away on, on biblical interpretation. Friends, that's not arrogant. I think it's even worse to admit that you're not squared away on biblical interpretation. I mean, can you imagine that? Well, are you squared away on, on what the Bible means and what the Bible teaches? Oh, no, I'm not. I have no idea what it means. Well, why am I going to listen to you? You've got people that are admitting they're not squared away on biblical interpretation, but yet you're citing them as authority, and then you're saying you know how to bring about the unity of the faith by writing all these creedal statements that are going to bring everybody together so we know how to answer all the questions. Does that make sense, friends? That's like going to the doctor, and the doctor says, I have no idea how to help you with your disease, but I've written a, I've written a manual on it, I've written a thesis on it, and this is what you need to do. Why would I read that? See, in, in Ephesians 4 and verse 13, Ephesians 4 and verse 13, this is what Paul says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The unity of the faith. Friends, there has to be some unity of the faith, but apparently our friends in the Methodist Church aren't going to find it because they're, they're willing to admit they're not squared away on biblical, interpret uh, yeah, biblical interpretation. Now, who's being arrogant there? That's, that's, that's silly. All right? Let's move on. Then he says, the process by which we generate, listen, the process by which we generate uh, our written guidance, while imperfect, does, does have considerable provisions for peer review by many qualified scholars. Those many qualified scholars that won't admit that they're Squared away on biblical interpretation, those, those, those qualified scholars that can't get things like born in sin right or women pastors right. And I'm going to believe that, well, at least they're checking each other out, you know. Well, does that really give me confidence? And listen again what he said. The process by which we generate our written guidance. There's the key right there. Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaker. They're generating their own guidance. Friends, I don't need to generate my own guidance. God's already generated it. Why would I need to generate my own guidance when God has written a book? Again, why do I need to write a manual on how to read the manual? Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10, 23. Jeremiah 10, verse 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. But he can generate his own guidance by writing what he thinks the Bible teaches. 
Because he wants to believe certain things that a man has taught him. Friends, is that, is that really where we are? Generating our own guidance? Romans 1 verse 22. Romans 1 22. Listen. Professing themselves wise, they became fools. They, cha- uh, they became fools and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like an uncorruptible man. Professing themselves wise. Isn't that really what we're talking about? Qualified scholars, peer reviews. We're writing, we're writing these things because we don't believe that men can understand the Bible alike, so we're going to write them so that we can tell all the other Methodists at least what we believe. But friends, even think about that. The, the Methodist discipline has changed how many times? They, they read. They revamp it every so many years. It must not be a very reliable self-guidance book. We have to rewrite it year after year after year. Time after time, we have to rewrite it, rewrite it. And again, we're not just talking about the Methodists. The Baptists do it too. They have their convention where they rewrite what their bylaws and their creeds are. The Wesleyans do it. They rewrite, rewrite. The Catholics do it. They got a pope. The Pope will come on and he'll say something. Oh, he's speaking for Christ. Let's write it down. He's infallible when he's speaking ex cathedra. He's infallible. And then another Pope will come along and say something just the opposite. Oh, he's infallible, even though it's just contrary to what the other Pope said. Really? Is that the kind of self-guidance you want to generate? I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to understand this, friends. How is it, how is it that people can say they're so smart... But yet, then turn around and say, well, we're generating our own guidance. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. The only guidance I want is preaching of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness and the preaching to save them to believe. And so, when we're preaching the gospel, friends, <coughs> this is the wisdom of God. And a man comes along and says, well, we can't understand the wisdom of God, so we need to have some man-made wisdom to make a book so that we can understand God's wisdom. And thereby making God's wisdom Less than man's wisdom. And that's exactly opposite of what Paul said. Paul said that God's wisdom, the foolishness of God, is wiser, is wiser than the wisdom of men. God forgot more than men will ever know. So, who's really wise here? Who's really smart here? He goes on to say, he said, I have to suggest that what you're doing, and certainly what you would have to do if your faith claimed the entire U.S., is no less man-made than any of the present denominations. What am I doing? What am I doing? All I'm doing, friends, is I'm preaching the gospel. And I'm saying, let's get back to the Bible. That's all I'm doing. I'm saying, let's go to the Bible, and if something is contrary to, If what I believe is contrary to the Bible, then I'm going to change that. If what I believe the Bible teaches over here contradicts what the Bible teaches over here, then I'm going to change it. I'm going to say the Bible's right, I have to be wrong, I'm going to modify my thinking. Now, what am I doing? What am I doing that's uh, that's so bad? See? But he says... What, what, uh, what you are doing and what you would have to do if your faith claimed the entire U.S. is no less man-made than the present denominations. Friends, the present denominations write their own creed books and catechism with qualified scholars, right? They have peer reviews about what they've written to see if they'll all agree on it. Only they're going to change it in two or three years anyway. Now, I'm not doing that. So I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And yes, if I keep doing what I'm doing and people are honest and sincere, it'll claim the world. But not because of something, not because of something I've done other than just preach the gospel. Not something that I devised. See? 
All I'm saying is we can understand the Bible without the man-made creeds, the man-made disciplines, the catechisms, the manuals, the bylaws, the conventions. That's all I'm doing. And let me tell you, it's exactly opposite of what the religious world doing, is doing. The entire denominational world, the entirety of the churches of men, are not doing what I'm doing. And they're trying to conquer the world and bring unity that will never happen because Jesus said unity is going to come through his word. And they're writing books that are contrary to the word and what they're putting in the books are contrary to the word. The actual writing of the books is contrary to the word. Why do you need something to add to the Bible? Why do you need a secondary source of authority? This is where we all started. And this is why I'm saying, friends, the the, the bottom line, the underlying tone of all of this is people don't believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. If they did, they wouldn't need the Methodist discipline, the Wesleyan discipline, the Catholic catechism, the Baptist faith and message, or any other creed book or guidebook or bylaws or whatever. They wouldn't need all that. They should go to the Bible. Let's, God's already done the work. Let's just believe that. See that? Now, I said we're going to come back to this Wesleyan quadrilateral. Well, I've got a few minutes left. Let's do this. This is the Wesleyan quadrilateral. This is what uh, Phil said that I should read to show that they believe the Bible, the Scripture, uh, is their source of authority. I'm going to read this. It says... <clears throat> John Wesley believed, illuminate the core, uh, the, the principal factors that John Wesley believed illuminate the core of the Christian faith for the believer. Now, I'm not sure who that believer is. Is that the believer in general? Is that the, particularly the Methodist believer? Uh, he says, Wesley did not formulate the succinct statement now commonly referred to as the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Building on the Anglican theology, theological tradition, Wesley added a fourth emphasis, and that is experience. So, Wesley got his stuff from the Anglican Church. Again, it's not from the Bible. It's, based, it's a man-made tradition that it ought to be corrupted, and so he's just corrupting a corruption is really what he's doing. The resulting components are, or sides of the quadrilateral are Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. For a United Methodist, Scripture is considered the primary source and standard for Christian authority. All right, that's what we quoted earlier. The primary source is Scripture. But let's look at tradition. It says tradition is experience and the witness of development and growth of faith through the past centuries and in many nations and cultures. So tradition is the, wit is the experience and the witness of development and growth of faith. What does that mean? What does that mean? Tradition is the experience and the witness of development and growth of the faith through the past centuries in many nations and cultures? Is that saying that the, how the, the Methodist, Methodism has evolved and, in, in, uh, and grown and experienced? People have experiences and they're adding to it and they're adding traditions? Is that what we're talking about? I don't know, friend. I can't find that in the Bible. I can find traditions in the Bible. But you know what the traditions I find in the Bible? The traditions I find in the Bible are nothing like the traditions that I find in the Western Church. Methodism is based upon traditions from the Anglican Church. John Wesley founded Methodism based upon and used traditions that he had from the Anglican Church. Well, you know what? The church that I'm a member of, the church that, of, of Christ, the Lord's Church, the only church you find in the Bible, the only kind of church you find in the Bible, is founded upon traditions that were given by inspired men like Paul and Peter and James and John and so forth. They're inspired traditions. Listen to what, what the Bible is going to say. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 2 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Traditions that are handed down by inspired men. You can't find those in the Methodist church. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 14. Let's get one more right quick. 
If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man have no coming with him. We're talking about words and traditions and writings that were handed down by the apostles. Now, if you think you can't understand those things, you're going to have a problem following those traditions. I think we can understand them. I think we can agree on them. And therefore, we can have the unity that Christ desired. Friends, this is why it's so important. If you believe the Word of God, if you believe the Bible is the Word of God, then what you're going to do is you're going to use it as your guide and your standard, and you're going to say, we can believe this, we can understand this. Friends, before I wrap up, I've got just a few minutes left here, or a minute left, but here's what we're going to do. I want to remind you, a word from the Lord uh, on Sundays at 5 p.m., Rockingham County Radio, 1490 WLOE. Also remember the 10 meeting. 10 meeting starts September the 18th. That's, that's next Monday. All right? There's going to be a place to be announced. But anyway, friends, hope that you'll be out to the tent. Tune in to Word from the Lord, Sundays at 5 p.m. We'll see you there. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.